man. What are we talking about? Right, right, right and wrong. Come on, man. What are we talking about? Right, right, right and wrong. Corn Pop was a bad dude. <laughs> Whoa. Corn Pop was a bad dude. <laughs> Whoa. Come on, man. What are we talking about? Right, right, right and wrong. Come on, man. Welcome to Right and Wrong. This is a show where we try to wake up the woke by talking common sense about the issues of the day. I'm your host, Brian Ruka, and with me as always is my friend and yours, producer Juice. He's the truth box, ladies and gentlemen, because he continues to speak the truth week in and week out. What do you have to say to the right and wrong folks out there, my friend Juice? The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, No secret is revealed. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Always crushing it with those. Always crushing it. Continue that great work, my friend. Well, we're working at the speed of a Maricopa County poll worker these days, pumping out these episodes. I'm sure my cousin Bonnie's ready to wring my neck up there uh, in in Massachusetts. It was bad enough not traveling back up home for her wedding, but now I'm throwing off her entire weekend routine with these right and wrong delays. She's going to kill me. And I am doing good not calling her that dreaded name that she doesn't want to be called. But y'all don't say that. So I just want that as a as a little silver lining, I guess, to make maybe help me uh, inch out of the doghouse. Well, we originally delayed this episode, hoping to get some better results or any results from these ridiculous midterms. And surprise, surprise, the longer the vote counting took, the worse things got for Republicans. Uh, on today's show, we'll be diving into the fallout from this red wave that turned out to be the red trickle, trickle, trickle. I think we can sum up our feelings here on the Right and Wrong Show the same way that Michael Scott did when he uh, realized Toby was back from Costa Rica. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 (laughs) This episode today for us is going to be very election heavy. We'll take a look at uh, the demographic breakdown from exit polling and how an overwhelming amount of single women voted Democrat. I'm interested to trace how the left has been developing this group of voters for years now by the way that they've been able to successfully reorder the culture and society that we live in. We'll also talk about the way that casting a ballot's changed and discuss if that's a good thing or not. And here's a little hint. We're not big fans of the way it's going. Did I just channel my inner President Unity there? I got them $1.9 trillion relief so far. Listen, Jack, we don't like these mail-in ballots, okay? I, 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 I'm not kidding. 
The Truth Box has been all over the Twitter machine uh, these past two weeks, finding us some great clips to use in our rights and wrongs of the week. And we continue to hear some great, great positive feedback about that segment. So keep that up. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting us know your feelings out there. And, you know, we've got an epic come on, man, to close out the show as usual. And at this point, I do need to remind you guys, I'm being forced by the producer to let you guys know about this that we do need you to please subscribe to the show, hit that like button, even give us a five-star review if you feel so kind. Help us spread the word and share our show with a friend. That's really, really going to help us grow. And the midterm results are a perfect example of how the left continues to win this messaging battle. We'd like to help shape and shift that narrative in in any way we can, and we need your help to get uh, in front of more listening ears. So please spread the show, share the word, help us out a little bit. And with that being said, I think it's about that time to bring in our friend, good old Mr. Ric Flair, because it is showtime, baby. Woo! Showtime! Woo! 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 We live in an age and an era of instant everything. The most obvious example of this is the way that we communicate. We have FaceTime, text messages, and phone calls. If no one's there to talk to us personally, we have the black hole that is the internet. You can find an online forum where people are debating whether Mike Seaver or Alex P. Keaton was the better 80s sitcom character, if that's kind of your thing. If that's not really your thing, there's Twitter, Facebook, Truth Social, TikTok, YouTube, and Rumble. The point being, you can communicate with anyone, anywhere, at the snap of your fingers. Literally, in an instant. I don't think we stop and appreciate how impressive and how valuable of a commodity instant communication is. Think back and try and imagine what it must have been like to communicate a message of self-sacrifice for the greater good of unifying 13 colonies during the era of our founding fathers. Those men traveled hundreds of miles to meet in Philadelphia and hash this idea of America out face-to-face with each other. They didn't have the luxury of a conference call. They couldn't gather for a Zoom meeting. The people living in the 17 and 1800s had to make their words count when they had an audience in front of them. They also had to work a hell of a lot harder to get their message to spread. They couldn't rely on a retweet, and they didn't get that instant gratification of getting a notification every time someone agreed with them by hitting a thumbs-up button. We live in a time and an era of instant travel. I often think about my father-in-law telling me how his summer vacation was spent in a cabin down in Plymouth. No bells and whistles attached to that, literally just leaving the city and going 50 miles south to stay in a cabin that was operated with an outhouse. Meanwhile, my 11-year-old son has been to Disney World four or five times already. Disney World was a -a once-in-a-lifetime trip a few generations ago. You think we take the ease and convenience of travel for granted these days? Do you think our kids will realize just how lucky they are to be able to travel the way that we currently travel? What about our grandkids or great-grandkids? This generation now grew up going backpacking through Europe after college in order to find themselves before they figure out what to do with their lives. My dad went traveling through Europe out of high school too. It was called joining the United States Army. People of his generation and generations before him worked and made decisions to achieve a longer term goal. We've grown so used to that instant satisfaction that it seems like a lot of us have forgotten that the pursuit is 90% of the battle. Will those lessons and that mindset live on in future generations? We live in a time and an era of instant sexual gratification. Long gone are the days of people waiting to have sex until they get married. Why go through the trouble of getting to know someone when you can just swipe left on Tinder and enjoy a night of instant sexual gratification? Why bother trying to appeal to the opposite sex on a deeper level when you can just tie one on, jump in the sack, and go your separate ways with no strings attached? We've conditioned an entire society to pursue sexual desire without any long-term consequence in place to help curb that animalistic instinct. The world that we've created of abortion on demand and hookup culture has allowed generations of people to ignore the long-term effect of procreation. The left has succeeded in removing the goal of creating life from the act of having sex. Now, I say all this because it's important to remind ourselves that the battle to win back our culture will not happen overnight. We live in this instant everything era too, but we can't get discouraged because of a midterm election result. We must recognize that the fight to win back our culture is going to be a fight that we will be fighting for our whole lives. 
the left has been building towards this point in time for 50 plus years now. They've chipped away at the family. They've chipped away at marriage and they've chipped away at religion. They've already succeeded at weakening those institutions. Now they're chipping away at our borders and at the incentive of being an American citizen. They're chipping away at parents knowing what's best for their own children. They've chipped away at the trust you have in your own doctors. And they're chipping away at reality when they tell you with a straight face that men can become pregnant. What is it going to take to wake up the opposition? When are the rest of us going to understand that we are in a war of ideology? We are in a war over what's right and what's wrong. It's a battle of good and evil. And if you can't recognize that it's evil to convince a child that they're actually the opposite sex, then it's time you wake up and start thinking a little bit more about this stuff. And although the red wave didn't happen the way we hoped, it's important to remember that this is a generational battle that we're fighting. We're fighting to shape the world that our children will inherit from us. Alexander Graham Bell created the telephone, but he didn't live to see what that invention morphed into. The Founding Fathers created this great nation, but they didn't live to see it morph into the superpower that it is today. We will fight, and we will succeed in stopping child mutilation and the overall woke takeover of our country. But we will not be here by the time our actions today are rewarded. It's our children and grandchildren that will get to enjoy that. And it's that time in the show, ladies and gentlemen, that we get to recognize some like-minded individuals out there, ones who are thinking the correct way and uh, thinking on the right side of the uh, problems and the issues, the equation, I guess. So without further ado, let's uh, get right to our rights of the week. And starting off at number five, we're going to go to one of our favorites here on the rights, Mr. Primetime 99, Alex Stein. He was uh, recently on the Tucker Carlson show talking about how he got spat upon at uh, Penn State University. So, Juice, you want to take it away? Number five, right of the week. Number five. And yet Penn State tells us that Alex Stein doesn't share their values. Okay. Alex Stein shares our values. He joins us tonight. Alex Stein, great to see you. So why do you think Penn State, you get spit at by a woman at a mob on Penn State's campus. You have to be driven away by police. Why can't the president of Penn State, Neely Benaputi, say that's wrong? Well, because this is an indoctrination camp from middle school to high school to college. These kids are radicalized to have these leftist ideologies that are not beneficial to society. So these people <laughs> actually literally spit and assault us in public and they're defended by their administrators. So this is the sad reality in which we live in. And Tucker, I want to make this point. I want to start off by making this point. A lot of people after this protest footage went viral, they say, Alex, you're fearless. Don't you get scared when you go in front of these protesters? And I, and I want to say this. Today's October 25th. I don't want to get emotional. My mother died one year ago today, and she died in my arms from the protocols in the hospital given remdesivir without my authority. So watching my mom die, there's nothing scarier than that. So me seeing a bunch of idiot college kids spit on me and yell at me, I have no fear. And that's what I want to try to express to the people out there. She spit on me, but the government and these people that are in power are spitting on us every day and telling us it's raining. So all I want to do is try to wake people up to the harsh reality in which we live in, Tucker. Amen to that, Alex Stein. And he said it right there. Like, how many other people have gone through that of losing a loved one during these crazy, ridiculous lockdowns and all these COVID measures where you couldn't be there with them or they you know, were given no hope because they were secluded in a hospital room. And that's right for him to bring that up. And I'm glad he did. And then as far as what he said with being a afraid of these college knuckleheads, no, they're going to spit on you. Some creepy purple haired kids going to spit at you. Go ahead. Let them. They look like the idiot. And he comes out, um, you know, doing the doing the work, doing the tough stuff. And he's not everyone's cup of tea. I get it. But all he's doing is is saying things that are pretty practical and true. And he can provoke this much outrage from people uh, kind of shows you where our world is headed. So uh, keep doing what you do, Primetime 99. Next! Oh, we're so scared! Primetime 99 is on the grid! We're going to go to um, our number four, right of the week. Got this one directly from the infamous group chat that me and the producer are involved in. 
from uh, Mr. Jorsky himself sending this one over. Uh, but let's hear what this woman's bright idea was for taking a stand because abortion is going to uh, not be as prevalent as it once was. Juice? Number four. Y'all decided to ban abortions, so I'm deciding to ban sex. You guys will no longer be getting any cutie from me. Like, you will literally have to be my husband. I swear to y'all. Like, it is in no way that y'all are going to even accidentally get a bitch pregnant or none of that. Like, you're done. You're done. Just to translate out there, I know she mumbled a little bit and uh, used some terms you might not be aware of. She said, if you think you're going to get any coochie from me, which um, it, she's referring to sex, um, you better be prepared to marry me, be my husband, because... <laughs> We can't go down this road anymore, basically, is what she's saying. And ding, ding, ding. You know, she's putting it up there trying to say that this is ridiculous, that she can't get an abortion whenever she wants. Uh, and yet, here she is finding herself as a right on the Right and Wrong show, because uh, without her even realizing it, she gets the point. She's speaking the point in, in what should be strived for in our society, in our culture. Again, most people listening, uh, most people out there that live in this world have sex before they get married nowadays that's just a fact of reality we we have all done it so i don't want to be the pot calling the the kettle black is that the term essentially be smart about it though maybe choose less partners maybe be a little bit wiser about choosing the partners that you are having because uh you know if you happen to become pregnant you should take that responsibility to become married start a family with that person so uh if you are going to go sleep with somebody become intimate with somebody, make sure it's somebody that you uh, would be willing to spend the rest of your life with. And she's saying that as like a bad thing, like going on a sex strike until, until you guys smarten up and uh, decide you might want to marry me. Then I'll have sex with you. Terms accepted, my friend. Next. Nice execution. You're doing terrific. The number three right of the week is going to go right back to the Tucker Carlson show. Tucker's been mining the right and wrong, uh, you know, vault here for all of his guests lately, I guess. So I don't know if he's stealing from us or we're stealing from him. Maybe it's just a little bit of, um, you know, friendly, friendly fire here, I guess. But um, this is Candace Owens on the Tucker Carlson show uh, just last week. And we love Candace. So let's hear what she had to say. Juice. Number three. It really does pay to have a backbone, Tucker. I think early on when you and I were prodding this narrative about Ukraine, any person that had any questions didn't just immediately throw up a Ukrainian flag in their bio, uh, was instantly called a Russian puppet, right? Asking some very simple questions that everybody should ask. Isn't it suspicious that we were just told that we needed to leave the Afghan war? Very sloppily, by the way. We announced that on August 31st, 2021. And then the very next day, on September 1st, America said that we were, we were joining an effort. We were locking arms with the EU to join an effort to help Ukraine join NATO. We left one money money laundering operation in which we gave $50 billion of American payers' hard-earned money, and we jumped right into the next one. And how much have we given Ukraine so far? $50 billion. Not enough for this welfare queen. He wants to keep it coming, and that's what he is. President Zelensky is America's welfare queen. And if you want to know where all this money is going, I spent a couple of weeks in Europe. People are saying that Ukrainian officials are buying property in Switzerland. Again, these are questions that we should be investigating, and if Republicans do take back a house in the Senate, it. We need to seriously start to make sure that we know where every single one of these dollars is going. We have all these amazing IRS officials. Remember, we're expanding the IRS, right? Well, why don't they start looking into the money that we're sending overseas? That's if a single Ukrainian official has bought property in Switzerland at the same time that we're sending them they are. tens of billions of dollars. Well, how is that not the greatest scandal of the moment? I don't understand. I, I really don't. It is 100 percent true. They've left. Uh, they have a bunch of Russian officials have left their properties empty in in Switzerland and Ukrainian officials are showing up in Lamborghinis and purchasing those properties. That is 100 percent factual. And I'm telling you guys that today. And of course, they're going to ignore it and call it a conspiracy, as they always do. COVID was a conspiracy until we were proven right. BLM was all a conspiracy until we were proven right. And the Ukraine stuff is all a conspiracy. Give it a couple of weeks and the conspiracy theory will be proven true. Candace nailing it as usual. Uh, and what about when she she mentioned Afghanistan and the pull out there? What about all the money and the weapons that were left behind, um, just forfeited, left there? Billions of dollars worth of weapons and machinery left there for um, the, the Taliban to take. Insane. Absolutely insane. There's a great line, too, about Zelensky being a welfare queen. <laughs> Keep it up, Candace. Keep it up. Next. You're not going to hate me. So the number two 
right of the week this week is going to be this guy that you simply called a badass to me when he sent this clip over. So let's hear what he had to say when uh, attacking some of the election procedures in his area. Juice? Number two. Because I know more than everybody in here about what you're doing in my district. Yes, I know how you manufacture votes. I know how you leave the votes in the machines. I know how you do it. And the thing is, we're not crazy. No, no. We're, we're not crazy. We're not, if I go outside of this building and I run a stop sign, I'm going to get stopped. They're going to ask me for what they need to ask me for. If I have warrants, I go to jail, right? Your election administrator can violate the law and nothing is done. You can't ask the DA to do anything about these people because the voter harvesters worked on her campaign. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Oh, they want to talk. Yeah. See, when I come in the building, I can change the atmosphere. I'm the weatherman <laughs> because I know what's going on. And they don't have the guts to stop me. They won't threaten me. I wish you would. Do you know what my pronouns are? I wish them would. <laughs> Those are my pronouns. And I stand for everybody in here, everybody in the county. So I'm going to read you something that came to me during early voting from a election judge. Democratic election judge on October 30th at 1212 12 p.m. They came by about 3 p.m. to pick up the ballots. My bag can hold 3,000. So my monitor down there with the numbers, they sent me an email to call and request for ballot bag replacement. I did not call them. Why was those ballots moved? Why did they move those machines in the middle of the day? You know why they moved those machines in the middle of the day? Because they manipulated those votes. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna say it in here, and I got I got a little time because we all in the same family. Yes, sir. And I ain't gonna hide nothing from what I feel is the worst criminal that I've ever laid eyes on in two years, Mr. Ellis, and I know you back there watching me. It's me versus you, and I'm gonna drag you like a Persian rug clown. I'm gonna drag you like Call. I know y'all, y'all, they made y'all do something a few weeks ago where you removed a man and all that. I can call him a clown. I can call him whatever I want to call him. According to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, where I won 300000 against HISD for trying to restrict my speech. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what we ain't going to do. As long as I don't curse him out, and as long as I don't threaten him, I can say what I want. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We sick and tired of that <laughs> We sick and tired of him. And guess what? It's gonna be us to take that Negro out there. See, when am I saying that? Wow. Straight fire. Coming in, calling it like it is. That's what the Dems call speaking truth to power, ladies and gentlemen. Next. When am I saying that? All right, our number one right of the week goes to this legend out there in the Twitter world. Her name is Morgan Zagers, and she uh, just crushed it with this take that she comes with. So I don't want to steal her spotlight. Let's hear what she had to say. Juice? Number one, right of the week. What are you going to do when you say that the world's going to end in 10 years and the world is overpopulated, so to solve the problem, we can't be having as many kids? Just seeing the way that they connect all these issues in their minds makes me really worried because in communist China, they literally forced abortions onto anybody yep. who had more than one child. Yep. Then they forced sterilized all the women that dared to get pregnant. So women were secretly having their kids and then keeping the kids in little tents and, and barns in the countryside. So it, this is not us like freaking out and creating some hypothesis of what could happen. Uh, this is actually what leftist regimes do, right. especially when they start running out of resources. We now have the Biden food shortage coming, and this is a classic step after leftist policies destroy a country. After they had the famine in China, they had no resources, and it resulted in the one-child policy. So this is disturbing. Leftism is evil. It's satanic. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised at all that now they're saying don't have kids. Amen. 
I love how viewing the the future from her point of view, trying to um, foresee the direction that we're being led into. Uh, it is crazy conspiracy kooky, yet the direction the climate people are trying to lead us in because um, the sea levels are going to raise. What did uh, what did Trump say the other day? Like half an inch over three hundred years. You know, we have to do this, 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 that, and this while we're currently living. So those people are taken completely sane, rational, reasonable, and someone who kind of can see the same playbook that happened over in China, calling it out and, you know, forecasting what it might look like is considered, you know, fringe, crazy conspiracy theorist. So more people need to see that and keep speaking like that. And hopefully, again, that's what we do here on the Right and Wrong Show. So thank you again for those five wonderful rights, Mr. Juice. Great job, as always. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And uh, we're going to move on with the rest of the show. Next... So I'm sure you guys have all seen already by now uh, the breakdown from the exit polling uh, that came out after all these these midterm elections here. And it was a staggering uh, jump in the amount of single women that voted Democrat. And that was 70 percent of single women voted Democrat during these elections. Everything else was like in the 50s, you know, 56 percent of, um, I believe, like men voted Republican, married women, married men, single men, you know, the way it all broke down like that. And the biggest aberration was that 70 percent of single women voting Democrat. I want to dig into that and kind of ask the question, why? Like, what's what's appealing to the Democratic Party for single women? And my belief is that the Democrats pander to a base like that. You know, the policies, the decision making, the stuff that they come up with is going to be um, geared towards benefiting, um, you know, single women. And I guess the most glaring example of it is going to be um, the abortion issue, obviously. And, you know, the, the overturning of Roe versus Wade with the Dobbs decision over the summer. And I'm sure that did motivate a whole wave of um, of single women to go vote. And, and it's because of that message that they've been hammered home their whole lives that having an abortion is their right and having an abortion is, you know, their ultimate power and control and their decision when the message all along should have been, you've made that decision to have sex, to put yourself in a position to become pregnant. And the baby is the result of the act that you chose to take, that you could have controlled, that you have ownership over putting your body in that situation. But nobody wants to hear that. So instead, it's abortion on demand because that's your body, your choice. And it's just it, it's interesting when you think about the differences. And, you know, you can go back to the old the old adage that a lot of people start off Democrat, you know, when they're younger minded in through college and then uh, slowly but surely by the time they get married have a family and start raising kids, they've already, they, they've started shifting more towards being conservative Republican. Um, you know, maybe not the way me and Juice are, not um, the way most of you out in the, in the audience are, but, you know, I think probably the traditional way that most people in the world are, where they're not diehard Democrat, not diehard Republicans. They're more in the middle, but um, yeah, I, I think as people start getting a little bit older, getting more responsibility and starting their families, they definitely start leaning and tending more Republican. That's because there's an incentive behind that. You know, now you have a family, so you're more invested in what's good for your entire family, not just for yourself. You now have children, so you're very interested in what your children are learning in school. That's the backlash with all the public education stuff going on these days. Don't trans my kids, like, right? That type of stuff. Why would a 20-something-year-old who's single and just got out of college care about what's being taught in the public school system. They don't. They're not as invested. They're surface level. And that's why the Democrats and, you know, I'm sure a whole group of these single women, the 70 percent of them, they support the drag queen story hour type of stuff. They want the, the trans ideology in the schools because their kids aren't in there. They don't have their kids in the schools getting this stuff drilled into them. They're not answering those tough questions at home when their eight year old Ask, ask them why why little Susie has a penis. They don't have to deal with that. 
So, of course, it's, oh, yeah, what? A, oh, that's fine. Don't discriminate. Love is love, man. And then if they do have a family, as they get older, once they get married, then their the tone is going to gonna change a little bit on that. But unfortunately, we've taken away the incentive of marriage. We don't promote that anymore. There is, there's no reason for it, right? We've got all these different types of relationships now, and we've got people that, oh, I don't even need to get married. We'll just live together, have kids, and raise a family. What's marriage? What do we need to marry for? You're going to be treated the same one way or another. Sometimes you're going to get more perks if you stay single on paper. We've removed religion from a lot of people's lives. So again, there's no reason to get married under the eyes of God. We've completely dismantled what marriage actually is and, and was for the entire existence of mankind with the redefinition of marriage. If anybody can get married and there's no no sexual difference needed for marriage, what's the incentive for it? What What's the benefit on society? You know, it used to be that you should get some tax breaks or you should get some incentive for starting a family, for creating lives, for building your community. That's a That's a necessity for our world, for our population. But they've taken that away. There's no reason for that anymore. Anybody can get married. And believe me, I'm not against two people that love each other. If they're the same sex and they want to do their thing, have at it. But that is not the same thing as marriage. That's not what marriage has always been. Civil union, if that's what you want to call it, two people living together, whatever you want to do. But there's no benefit to the community from that per se. If everybody decided to do that, then we wouldn't have a human existence anymore. We would become extinct. We obviously need people to be married to come together to create life. And the Democrats have been doing this for years now, starting with the feminist movement all the way up into where we are today. The thought that being a housewife, raising kids, starting a family is a bad thing and it's not something to be proud of. That's where that thought started way back when in the in the 60s and it's carried over and now all of a sudden it's so ingrained in our culture and our world and our society that people live that way now and they don't strive to create a family anymore. I said it like a uh, last episode about how no one wants to talk about that type of stuff anymore. Everyone wants to talk about how's work going, right? That's how every small talk conversation starts. So how's work? So think about like what people what people feel. If you're if you're a housewife, you raise your kids and stuff like that. And now you feel weird when you're at a cocktail party or you're at a, a family party and someone tries to say, how's work? And you have to sheepishly say, oh, uh, I stay home and raise the kids. Like, that's something you should be super proud about and be pumped about. But I just think people people make you feel like that's not enough for some reason, where that's the most important job in the world. Who cares what other people do to bring some money into the to their home? You're shaping and molding and, and nurturing young minds, another human's life. That's the most important job in the world. And we've devalued that and made it, made it seem like it's not something to strive for. It's more important to go out and become a corporate lawyer or, uh, or a professor uh, at some junior college next to Dr. Jill. The entire conversation when it comes to marriage, I think, is, is an important one because People are so afraid to have that conversation. And again, I, I, I know gay people. I have gay people in my family. And I have nothing against that. I have no ill will. I, I don't wish you anything bad. But I just think that the left has completely redefined what the word marriage means and what it, what it stood for for so long by making, you know, by, by getting involved in it and in, in making it anybody can marry anybody, whoever they want. And I thought it was super interesting when listening to the Joe Rogan episode where you have Matt Walsh on, I highly recommend going and listen to that. It's a very long episode, like most of Rogan's are. But skip forward to about the last like 40 minutes or so of the of the episode, and they go back and forth for a while about marriage, and it's awesome. Number one, it's great that two people who were completely opposite views on it could actually sit there and have a conversation that went back and forth for about 45 minutes without either of them yelling at each other, getting all pissed off, and without either of them just, you know, cordially agreeing with each other either. It was a back and forth conversation, and it was fine. Like, that can exist. That should exist. You should be able to do that. 
in. I just thought it was interesting because it felt like they were talking about two completely different things the entire time and they were never able to completely make that connection. So Rogan's case was love is love. Like, why can't two people, if they're the same sex, decide that they want to be together and make it official, um, you know, have that document? And Walsh's point was like, because marriage is sacred, it's it's more than that. And Rogan basically kept going back to, it's a piece of paper that makes it legal. And again, Walsh's point was, it's more than a piece of paper. It's more than just a legal document. And I think that's what people have forgotten. And the thought of marriage as just a binding contract legally in the courts is why marriage rates are suffering. It's simply a legal document. And you just need a couple lawyers and you can always find a way out of a legal document where before marriage meant something. It was a it was a vow and a bond. It was more than a legal document. And that type of mindset, I think, has completely undermined the institution of marriage. The abortion on demand has completely decentivized even pursuing marriage. The motivation for just blind career success has resulted in less people pursuing marriage. And the left feeds right into that. They push things that are individual incentives. The right incentivizes families and community and the bigger picture. And it's no wonder that 70% of single women are voting with that individual incentive mindset. My body, my choice, my student loan debt relief, my career success is at jeopardy. And that's what they went and that's what they voted for. And that's the message the Democrats send to them. And it's working for the left, and we need to be able to express this on the right and explain it and do it in a way that makes a little bit more sense than we always have. And I don't know if I just succeeded at that. I might have dug myself into more of a hole, but it's something I'm going to continue to talk about. And, you know, I, I just think it's important. And our future as a country and as Americans depends on on preserving the institution of family, the institution of marriage, the institution of America. So it's now that time in the show where we get to go to all the cringeable, cringeworthy type of stuff that we have for you that that the truth box has gathered up for us. This is what we like to call the wrongs of the week. So without further ado... Let's start off right here with number five. Uh, This one here is a news report talking about like what the top issues were during the midterm elections. And they were pretty surprised that democracy was not in the top five issues that that people spoke about. Juice. Number five. The numbers in these exits do not line up with what we were seeing in the polling data going into this election about what people cared about and the order in which they ranked it. So we have had a lot of questions throughout this time about New voters, people that hadn't been in there before that were perhaps not getting captured by the polling. So maybe this is a sign that we're going to see a little bit more of that tonight than we expected. We obviously don't know yet. And you know what's missing from this one, two, three, four, five, top five issues? Democracy. Oh, yeah. It's not even in here. It's not to say that it's not an issue for people, but it doesn't even come issue. close. Well, not I the do issue. Think that- yep, the old doom and gloom. Democracy is going to die if you express your right to freely vote out there in the country. That's killing democracy unless you vote for the for the Republicans. Look at that Freudian slip. Unless you vote for the Democrats. That's the way they try to sell it to their base. But people were saying that wasn't an issue for them, at least not in the top five. Next. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Number four. Uh, I wonder what this lady's top issue was in the midterms. Uh, she was pretty concerned about the opening of the Black Panther movie and had this to say um, about... Who should be allowed to go and see it? Juice. Number four. This message is to all our would-be accomplices and white allies. This message is to all the white people who have BLM in their bio. If you really want to prove to black people that you love us and you care about us and you are down for the cause, do not go see that movie opening weekend. You buy your ticket. You give it to a black person or a black family who can't afford to go. And then you go sit at that theater in front of the doors. You make sure that every black person in that theater can enjoy that movie in peace. You make sure that you use your body to block us from anybody who would be coming in that theater to do us harm. That is your job. 
You can go see it on another weekend. Go see it on the second or third weekend. But the first weekend, that's for us. To do anything other than this is anti-Black. Wow. I mean, you don't even need to say it, but I guess I will. Imagine flipping that around and saying the same thing from any other context. Absolutely insane. Uh, I know one thing she left out that I was actually considering. I was really, you know, something came up at the last minute, so it pulled me away. I wasn't able to do it. But I was not only going to buy a ticket for a black family, I was going to guard the outside of it for them. I was going to get their popcorn, drinks, and stuff for them, too. But I was going to stay there the whole movie and go in and out of the theater and refill their popcorn for them. I was going to uh, fluff a pillow for them if they needed that. If they had to hit the recline button on their reclinable seats, I was going to come over and push the button for them so the seat would go down. And then when they came back from the restroom, push the button again for the seat to go back up for their feet. So I was ready and, and amped up to go do all that just because, you know, I am so privileged and so white that... I felt like I needed to do that, but gosh, something came up at the very last minute and I wasn't able to do it. So uh, I, I guess I'll get you guys on the next one. Next. <laughs> <laughs> the number three wrong of the week is going to be from uh, someone who definitely has an interest in killing democracy. Juice's favorite um, world leader, I guess. I mean, he's technically not even a world leader, just a just a wannabe Bond villain. Klaus Schwab. He spoke at the G20 summit the other day, and uh, let's hear what he had to say. Number three. Of course, if you look at all the challenges, we can speak about the multi-crisis, an economic, a political, a social, an ecological, an institutional crisis. But actually, what we have to confront is a deep, systemic and structural restructuring of our world. And this will take some time. And the world will look differently after we have gone through this transition process. Politically, the driving forces for this political transformation, of course, is the transition into a multipolar world which has a tendency to make our world much more fragmented. And for these reasons, events like this one, the G20, and so on, are the very important connectors to avoid a too great segmentation you think those ideas are going to be met with resistance, you psycho? That guy's just missing the cat, the Mr. Bigglesworth or, or whatever the one from Goldfinger's name was. That's literally what he's like. He's, he's you know, he's a Bond villain. We will take over the world and we will keep in place the asleep at the wheel, President Biden. We will keep him alive on our natural, on our jugs. And our serums and vaccines, and he will be in place while we take over the world. It will be done. You cannot stop us. And then he puts his pinky up to his mouth and starts. <laughs> Crazy stuff, people. Next. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum. <laughs> our number two wrong of the week is going to go out to one of our favorite people on the wrong segment. Our very uh, intelligent, very well-spoken vice president of the United States, Miss Kamala Ding Dong. Juice. Number two. People everywhere from every background. Because here's the thing. One does not have to abandon their faith, or deeply held beliefs to agree, the government should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. What? You don't have to abandon your deeply held belief that babies and life can't be murdered or must be protected? H how does that make sense? That's an oxymoron. That's, you know, stick, stick to, the, to the shiny buses being good. 
in the protection of the border that you've never been to. You absolute clown. Oh, you can be deeply held religious. You can believe that birth, that that life begins at conception, yet sit back and do nothing as millions and millions of babies are just murdered every day out there in the world. You can just sit back, do nothing about it, because after all, that's their right. You know, murder's okay. Let them do them. No wonder why people are pouring over the border with her in charge. Next. I've actually asked my team to do a Venn diagram. I love Venn diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> I just love Venn diagrams. You know, the three circles, right? Sometimes there are more. All right. And the number one wrong of the week, we're going to go right back to that G20 summit and listen to this guy's idea about how to control the population in the world and people next time we run into another pandemic. Juice? Number one, wrong of the week. So let's have a digital health certificate acknowledged by WHO if you have been vaccinated or tested properly, then you can move around. So for the next pandemic, instead of stopping the movement of the people 100%, which clock the economy globally, you know, you can still provide some movement of the people. Indonesia has achieved, G20 country has agreed to have this digital certificate using WHO standard, and we will submit into the next the, uh, World Health Assembly in Geneva as the revision to international health regulation. So hopefully for the next pandemic, we can still see some movement of the people, some movement of the goods, and movement of the economy. Wow. If that doesn't scare you, it absolutely should. That terrifies me. That's absolutely insane. That's like freezing your bank account type of stuff. Think back to that Canadian trucker thing where they broke that up by freezing people's accounts that donated to them. What? ability to take the will of the people away from them by messing with their money, by messing with their transportation. How about like the type of stuff California was talk is talking about with like being in control of the amount of energy you can use, uh, trying to talk you into turning your AC off, uh, trying to get everybody on electric cars, and then they're going to turn the electricity off when it's time to charge them for some reason. You know, they're not going to be explicit with it and tell you it's because of whatever they're trying to achieve at that point or whatever cause they're pushing. They're going to blame it on like a lack of supply or something like that. But inevitably, it puts them in in control. And what this guy's talking about is we have a pandemic or something. How are we going to control people to stay in their house? How are we going to stop the spread, if that's what they're saying? The 14 days that turned into 14 years to slow a spread. Oh, here's how we could do it. We can just freeze their assets. We can put GPS trackers on everybody so we know where they're moving to. That's the next thing, man. We're going to start having our uh, our wrists, you see, in, in a futuristic world. You're going to see, um, what's that, Blade Runner juice? Stuff like that. And it's going to be oh, like a little chip in your wrist and, and you pay for your, for your stuff that way. But who's in control of that when that happens? Absolutely insane. Next. It's a perpetual cycle that you never get out of. And it's a way to take your rights, your freedoms, close your business, take your wealth. Why? So you become dependent on government. Why? If you're independent, the government works for you like it's supposed to. If you depend on the government to give you a paycheck to feed your family every month because they closed your business on you, now the government doesn't work for you. The government rules you. And that'll do it for the wrongs of the week. That stuff, uh, please pay attention to it. Go ahead and look up some of that stuff we were showing you. That G20 type of stuff is is big time. That's on uh, Juice's Whalehouse, and it is that's the elite of the elite organizing and gathering, and they trying to shape the entire world. That's more than just America. That's they're trying to global politics right there, and they don't give a rat's ass about us. So. Be wary of that stuff. We got to ask questions. Don't just let that stuff go on without us uh, pushing back on it. And that'll do it for our wrongs of the week. Okay, so regardless of if you voted Democrat or Republican last week, can't we all come to the agreement that we need certain rules and measures in place in order to restore trust in this entire process? I mean, it's not right when no matter what side loses, feels like they've somehow been cheated or robbed. 
And I know the Democrats and the left like to point to the right and call them election deniers and this, that, and the other thing. But they've been doing that for years now as well. You know, crying and complaining about the way ballots are counted, the procedures in place to protect the elections. That's a tale as old as time. People have been trying to manipulate results and mess with elections since voting existed. That's always going to happen. There's nothing you can do about that. That's just human nature that people are going to try to do whatever they can in order to win. And the most passionate people on either side will stop at nothing in order to get their side of victory. They fully believe that it's like their moral you know, job and, and their moral right to get their you know, desired candidate into office. So they don't look at it as cheating or messing with it or whatever. I think us normal, sane, rational people can look at it and kind of understand that the more time you keep open for voting, the more opportunity you're providing somebody to mess around with it, to be screwy, to undermine the integrity of it. The more ballots that can just get shipped in through the mail, the more easy it is to tamper with those ballots. The more easy it becomes to fake somebody's signature or to, you know, strong arm someone into voting for the candidate you might want them to vote for. I mean, what did President Trump say in his, um, you know, kickoff to his new campaign that he announced two years in advance for his presidential run? Uh, he said it great the other day. That's that's probably the best thing he said during that speech. To eliminate cheating. I will immediately demand voter ID, same day voting, and only paper ballots. Voter ID, same day voting, paper ballots. We're going to go back to paper ballots, voter ID, and same day voting. (laughs) I mean, that's not that crazy of an idea, but the left freaks out about it. Oh, you're suppressing people. Really? I mean, is it? Like, how hard is it to show up the day of an election? That's not that hard. We know when they are. We already know when the presidential election is going to be two years from now. I think you can plan your time out accordingly to carve out however long it's going to take to go stand in line, present your ID so we know who you are and we know it's your only vote, one person, one vote, and punch the holes on the thing, you know, color in the the bubble on the paper ballot and drop it into a box. That way there's no machine malfunctions. That way there's no wondering, is this person the correct person? That way there's no counting for two weeks after the election to find out who wins. That way there's no question as to when was this postmarked? Does that signature match? All these different things that come into play. And I don't understand how that becomes such a polarizing issue and topic. Number one, we should be able to agree that we all want to win or lose, feel like it was done according to the will of the people. You know, democracy, the very democracy that the left claims is dying. I think we want people to have a say, to have their vote, but to do it in a way that's trustworthy, to do it in a way that we can all agree makes sense and clears up any confusion. Think back on Jimmy Hoffa in the union era that he was a part of. Al Capone politics back in old Chicago, right? What what do you think of when you when you think of that? I know me, I think of these big burly, you know, leg breaker type guys pounding on people's doors, collecting their ballot for them. The same way they got people to sign union cards, right? They'd hang outside on the shores and three people would follow a guy to his car and surround him. You're going to join the union, right? You're going to support this union? Oh, okay, good. If he doesn't, Next day, he goes to his car and his tires flattened, stuff like that. We all know that that happened. Now, if you don't have to show up at a poll, you don't have to show your ID and go ahead in and vote, what's stopping people like that from knocking on your door? Hey, did you mail in your ballot yet? Oh, yeah, this ballot right here. That's the one, right? You see Biden, B? Yep. Oh, yeah, that's the one you were going to vote for, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, it is. I'd hate to see something happen to this beautiful home of yours if you didn't vote for the Democratic candidate. Been a lot of fires going on in this neighborhood, huh? Might want to vote Democrat to make sure that 
doesn't happen in the future. Your choice, though. Oh, okay. You will? Sure. Oh, give it to us. We'll go drop it in the mailbox for you, too. Or go knocking, showing up at a nursing home, going from room to room with everything all filled out already. Hey, just put your signature here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dear. Yep. Oh, you remember the old good old days of the Democratic Party? Oh, yeah. Great new deal. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Oh, yeah, all those great Democrats of the past. They're the exact same party nowadays. Yep, go ahead, just just sign your signature there, Dolores. Sign your signature there, Grandma. We'll take care of it for you. Oh, yeah. Or we can keep going down this road with elections of, um, you know, you could mail in your ballots or early vote back in September. September. The election's in November. And what do the Democrats do? They put off their debates. They delay debates. They pull the old Biden 2020 strategy of hiding in his basement the whole time, avoiding any any speaking engagements, trying to get out of any debates that they that they had scheduled. You pull the old Fetterman thing. Oh, I'll debate you a week before the uh, election. Juice, what was that thing? Everybody was Googling in Pennsylvania how to change my early my early vote after they watched that embarrassment start his debate by saying hello and good night out there. Absolutely ridiculous. But that's the problem with this early voting, mass mail-in voting. Information comes out about candidates right up until election day. Republicans need to figure out how they can win with these current rules in order to get the power to put some more regulations in place to get back to a more trustworthy election process. And that should be common sense. Bro, bro, come on. It's nice cheating, bro. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it is now that time of the week, the glorious time of the week, where we bring you our Come On Man segment of the day. And we're going to go back to, uh, I believe this was... Good old-fashioned TikTok. Uh, I think this one came from Libs of TikTok, but let's hear what this um, tri-gender is, is what she's referring to herself as uh, had to say to describe, you know, the holy trinity of um, transgenderism, I guess. So let's uh, let's see what this person has to say. Juice? So a couple of people might have been surprised by my transgender pin that I put on this morning. I figured it's about time that I came out and talked about my gender identity. I am trigender, which means like a triangle, I have three genders. Male, female, and non-binary. And the difference between trigender and gender fluid is that I feel all three of these genders at the same time. All the time. It doesn't ever shift or change or where I feel one gender more strongly than the other, like gender fluid tends to be. Also, I should recognize and accept that a lot of people don't see non-binary as a third gender. They see it as something completely separate from the binary of male and female. Um, But for me, it's like a third gender. Or I guess you could call it a third identity. So how I feel gender-wise is like a man, like a woman, and as neither at the same time. I hope this clears things up, but let me know if you have any more questions. I'm happy to answer. (laughs) I love the ending to that. Hope this clears things up. (laughs) Actually, no. (laughs) Are you kidding me? I've never been more confused in my life. Let me know if you have more questions. Yeah, which which one of the try are you right now? Uh, You you are all three of them all at the same time. So I guess that, that just tells me that you have three multiple split personalities that are all there all at the same time and all three of them are completely batshit crazy so which one are we talking to now uh all three of them okay all three of you need to go see uh mental professional experts please not the gender affirming nut jobs out there that are just gonna feed your delusion you need like some serious serious counseling serious counseling my friend because that's just not right You are in for a rude awakening when, uh, you know, this whole fad fizzles out and you no longer get attention and likes and people's sympathetic encouragement for expressing that you're a male, a female, and non-binary all at the same time. When people get sick of that and the next best thing comes along and you're sitting there home alone, not knowing what to do with your life, 
that's when reality is going to smack you in the face and you're going to be like, now what do I do? Ladies and gentlemen, this stuff has gone way too far. And, you know, it's easy, I think, for us to push back against this gender affirming nonsense, the gender surgery type of stuff when it's being done to children. That's a given that like, like you don't even need to think about that. But we need to give some serious thought and some serious um, consideration to continuing to push back and go further than just protecting people under 18 from this stuff. Like, this is mutilation. This is sick, deranged um, health care being administered to people like that. The doctors who are, quote unquote, affirming that type of stuff, something needs to be done about them. Because... Think about someone who's mentally ill, sick, doesn't know where they fit in this world. They go in to seek therapy, to seek counseling, because they believe that, they literally believe that they are three sexes all on the binary scale all at once, the gender binary, or whatever she's calling it. Someone goes like that into one of these therapists, and instead of working on what's really going on, they just tell them, oh yeah, absolutely, yep, you are all three of those things. What is a woman? Ah, whatever you feel like today. What's a male? Go for it. That's you. What's non-binary? Non-argument from me. I don't care. But that's you. Here's some pills. Here's some drugs. Oh, you want some surgery? Sure, we'll do some of that too. Bill it to your uh, insurance company. Oh, we've just created a patient for life? Great. Yeah, no ulterior motive there. We really need to crack down on this type of stuff too. Because if we continue to allow this and and just accept it and be okay with it and that, you know, the libertarian Mitt Romney-ish milk toast rhino Republican people are all the, hey, you do you, man. Like, you know, cut taxes, you know, build, fund the military and let's go. That type of Republican, man, is is done. They, they've sold us out for years now and refused to push back and fight any of these culture wars and look where it's landed us look where we are today grown people sitting there saying i'm not just female i'm also male and i'm also not non-binary i'm trigender let me ask me any questions if you need me to clear that up for you and then they're teaching that to our children in schools this stuff needs to stop people it needs to end and we're the ones who have to do it We need to start that fight yesterday, and it's going to be a long battle and a hard fight, and we're going to need to do it for the rest of our lives. So please, prepare to fight that battle. Prepare to get some dirty looks. Prepare to annoy somebody at a family party if that's what it takes, um, you know, just for expressing reality and and a belief. Prepare to lose a few friends on Facebook because you're not willing to just put your, your head in the sand anymore. And... You, miss, tri-gender, holy trinity of the trans spectrum, have earned yourself one big, fat, classic. Come on, man. And that's our show for today. Thank you guys so much for joining in. And please remember, give us one of those likes, subscribes, and share the show with a friend. That's going to help us out so much. And with that being said, I have nothing else for you guys today. So thanks for having me. Wrong Show is produced by Juice. Executive producer, Juice. Audio mixer is Juice. Hair by Skull Shavers. Wardrobe and makeup by Ashley Ruka. Right and Wrong Song created by Juice. The Right and Wrong Show is copyright 2022 from Brian Ruka.